Hey, Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> excited, brother. Yeah, excited too. Yeah. How are you doing, Ricky? I'm doing all right. Awesome. Yep, I'm doing good. Good, good. Yep, so yep. Um, everybody, this is my good friend, Ricky Wade. Uh, he's going to share with us some, some of his testimony and what God has been doing in his life for the last uh, few years. And mm -hmm. then uh, before we get started, if we can just go ahead and pray and we'll get started, okay? Sure. So uh, Lord, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much, God, for all the work that you have done in Ricky's life, Lord. And in his marriage and his babies and just all the stuff that you've done and the way you've changed his life from uh, drug addiction and being lost and just out there to being saved and um, just just focused and laser focused on you and just uh, being a good husband, being a good father, uh, being a pastor, just in ministry and just uh, um, um, just helping uh, come around other other broken uh, vessels and trying to help uh, lead them in a good direction, Lord. So we just ask you just to be with Ricky, be with his wife, Tina, and their children. Uh, be with Tina. She's about ready to have another baby mm. on the way, Lord. So just bless her and bless that that baby. And uh, um, yeah, Lord, just be with them and be with this family that is growing and that they just continue to stay focused on you and and uh, live into your promise, Lord. So thank you for, for our time together to hear Ricky's story. We ask the, all these things to be blessed in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Yeah, man. So gosh, I've, um, I've been sober for 16 years. So I've known you for 14 years, I guess. How long yeah. have you been sober? 18. 18. In March, God willing, it'll be 19. Wow. So. Man, it's gone by, <laughs> it goes by quick, doesn't it? It does, yeah. It's incredible, man. I know, yeah. I can't even believe I got 16 years. It's like, it's, an, it's, yeah. it's, it's incredible. Like It is. Yeah. Just to have each year stack up against each other in, in, in good terms and not in bad. <laughs> yeah. Each year is such a blessing, right? <laughs> it, yeah. It's amazing. It is. Yeah. It's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought I could do so many good things in, in consecutive years. In right. <laughs> Productive members of society, <laughs> right? right? Exactly. <laughs> each year. Like, oh my gosh. The more no we get kidding. to do. Yeah, because I was very unproductive for, for a yeah, long time. Me too. So um, <laughs> so a little bit about yourself. So where were you born? Where were you raised? Uh, childhood, okay. all that stuff. I was born in Colorado. And let's see, we my I'm the youngest of three. And so my mom and dad split up when I was like six months, six or seven months. Mm -hmm. And so we moved from Colorado to California. And so my mom got a job out here in California and, and brought us out here and we started over and uh, up in Lake County area up there and kind of moved around in different places up in that area, went to school there. And that was where I did um, up until, uh, let's see, junior year in high school and came down to San Mateo. We left um, uh, that area. So, you know, drug addiction has really just kind of destroyed my, all, all the siblings, all my siblings are all in recovery mm -hmm. from drug and alcohol abuse and so from a very young age i think we kind of all um you know coming from a broken family model you know my mom worked to provide for us and so you know we kind of had each other <laughs> to support each other and and you know i'm not blaming the area at all but right up there was just you know kind of you do there's a few different groups of people that you kind of migrate towards you gravitate towards and for us you know i think the the substances helped us kind of live in denial of not having, you know, our dad around. Mm -hmm. And we didn't realize it. We just kind of, you know, were drew to that crowd because we, you know, now we know we have major abandonment, you know, that we deal with. Sure. We didn't know then, right, that that was kind of the, I think, the driving force behind our our using. Right. You know, and, and just speaking for myself, but I know, you know, my siblings as well, we, once we started drinking and using and doing these things, it wasn't just like a, you know, weekend thing. It wasn't, you know, we dove into it hard because it, it was really healing us. It was really allowing us to kind of escape. Escape. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you know, other than that, I had a, I had a good, you know, childhood. Like I said, my mom worked really hard and provided for us, you know, and I did sports and, you know, I did these things, but I, I think probably late middle school, early high school, I started, you know, kind of uh, experimenting with alcohol and cigarettes and, and stuff like that. And like I said, right away, it allowed me to kind of escape from, you know, these, these other um, challenges in my life. So it was very addicting for me and, you know, went down that path. And I would say about 10 years of just kind of um, 
escalating in how I use and drink and into narcotics and to hallucinogenics. And, you know, it was, you know, like everything, we say, the trash everything. can, right? Yes. Yeah. I was just talking with, you know, Pablo, our buddy Pablo. I was like, yeah, I had the beer. I had the, the joint. I had the pipe. I had the light. You know, it was all at one time. It was like this medley of, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that was the party, right? It wasn't yeah. just one thing. It was like I had to have all these things together. Yeah. You know, and then a little I chemistry having, lab. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the cigarette I, burning I, on the side and then, the, yeah. you know, <laughs> totally related. Everything's, yeah. So all yeah. the stuff going into the body, like the escape, I think that's a great word. It was yeah. not even realizing the insanity of, you know, some people might drink a couple beers or whatever, right? And I'm like, have this. <laughs> yeah. I, I love it when people come up to me and say, so what's your drug of choice? I go, everything. Yeah. <laughs> more yeah that was my drug of choice it was more yeah, right you had it i'll snort it smoke it or shoot it yeah it didn't matter yeah yeah and i was also kind of that like i haven't yet right oh i haven't you know used needles yet or you know but you heard about the yets you know for me it was like oh i'm smoking marijuana and i'm drinking but i'm not doing any you know narcotics yet like other people i know or some of my older friends yeah. until and, you, you know, were until i was <laughs> And, you know, for sure, I would have went down that path of, you know, using needles and all these other things if I had continued to go sure, deeper sure. into it. But, yeah, I mean, not really the insanity of, like, all the substances that I was putting in my body, right, to try to escape. Mm -hmm. And nothing was ever enough, right? And now looking back, I was like, that, yeah, that was just, you know, um, I, for a while, I was a blackout drinker, mm -hmm. you know, and my brother and everybody would tell me stories about it. You know, I would party all night in these, these hotel rooms at these places, and I would just you know, get sick, you know, vomit, and then wake up and just start drinking again. Like yeah. it was nothing, you know, like just no clue of the insanity. Right. You know, I had right. gotten sick and vomited outside and rolled around and, you know, I just woke up and I'm just like, this is normal, change my shirt and yeah. where's the liquor? Let's start again, you know, and yeah. just so that insanity that I look back on now, seeing how destructive it was. And so it's it's ran, kind of ran rampant through, through, through my family. And, uh, you know, yeah, so I mean, other than that, like I said, I felt like I had a good childhood, right? The growing up in, in a loving family and um, the drugs and alcohol took me down a, a really fast track to to insanity. And really, like I, I, I say now, it's the suicide mission that I was on to kill myself yeah. somehow. Either the substances or situations that I put myself in. So did you graduate from high school? I didn't, I dropped out. So I, I tried to transfer down to San Mateo county and because i was you know had been in trouble up sure. in up in lake county they didn't let me in to the school so i've kind of felt like a rejection okay and i didn't want to come down here anyway i was kind of fighting my family on it my mom on coming down to san mateo and so uh, they had already moved here my mom had already moved here yeah and so my brother and sister weren't really in the picture at that time um it was just me and my mom and and so she had already moved down here and she had been coming back and forth as i was visiting my friends up in lake county I didn't want to come down here. So I came down, the high school wouldn't let me in. So I just kind of said, well, they don't, you know, nobody wants me here. Like, why am I here? Right. <laughs> so that rejection just fueled my decisions to go deeper into my addiction down here. And so of course I found what I needed to do and I continued on that path. Sure, sure. You know, which jails, institutions and deaths. So that was kind of, you know, for me, the 10 years of, of drinking, using and insanity all around that led me to jail eventually. So many times. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> I know, I know that road. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I was like, all of a sudden, I started thinking about my, my little journey. Yes, yeah. I, I totally get it. Yeah. Um, so, wh where um, was your dad ever in the picture? Did you know him at all? No, he never was. Um, okay. We had made some contact with him when I was, I think, eight or nine years old. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was just kind of this area I think in my life of denial that I didn't know I was in denial about. Sure. So, you know, not really understanding like the effect of that dynamic, okay. you know, not having a father around and not having a whole family, right. you know, and we talk a lot about wholeness with God, right? right? And not understanding how, how negatively and how badly that impacted me emotionally, right? And spiritually right. and mentally and all that stuff. Kind sure. of just living in a, yeah, just a total <clears throat> um, bliss, you know, right. just, <laughs> just the, the total denial. Right. And it wasn't until later, until I was, I was meeting with a pastor, a friend of mine who's a mentor, who kind of called me out on it. I was telling him my story and my, my kind of my understanding of my dad and his, his role in my life. And he's like, you have a very distorted, you know, view, very limited and distorted view of your father's role in your life. And mm. I was like, whoa, interesting. And so it was at that time that he told me that I would reunite with my dad. Mm. He said, you're going to reunite with your dad and there's going to be healing. God's going to bring healing in your life around this thing. And I was, I had, you know, chills. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? I had never thought, yeah. you know, that that day would come. Sure, I'd always hoped that that day would come. 
but I had never really, what would that be like? I was terrified to think about what would that be like, right? right? To meet him and to see him and to talk with him and, you know, and then what happens after that, right? You know? Sure. So, and, you know, and it was just as my, my friend said, like later on, I reunited with my dad and cool. my sister, all three of us reunited with him after 30 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So before that, mm -hmm. um, so you're in San Mateo County in and out mm -hmm. of jail, mm -hmm. getting high. Um, you don't feel like you fit in. Yeah. Um, you're trying to fit in by getting high with all the other people that are getting high, which to mm -hmm. I totally relate with. Yeah. hundred percent. Yep. Um, so what was your turning moment? <clears throat> what, what, what finally did it for you? Um, it was my freedom. You know, I think I had many, many times where I had been arrested and on my way to jail and I was thinking like, you know, I had a moment of clarity, mm -hmm. but I would get out and it never lasted <laughs> the moment of clarity. Right, right. And so of course it, for me, it was like, well, you know, you've given me plenty of opportunities. You're on probation, you're violating your probation. You know, you continue to not learn, you know, we're giving you a lot of chances. And so for me, it was, okay, you're going to go to prison. Now you're, now you're facing three years prison time on mm -hmm. this case. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, right. you know, it was a wake up call. It was a shocker for me. Um, my biggest fear, right, was that the further I go, my, my whole time that my biggest fear was the further I go down this this life, the further I, deeper I go into this, the harder it will ever be to to come out, you know? Mm. And so that was a reality to me knowing that my, my, my biggest fear was if I went to prison, right, I would go deeper into the lifestyle. Sure. And because a lot of people I knew growing up, that's what they did, right? They didn't go in and rehabilitate. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. didn't go in and say, oh, I came out and I learned my lesson. <laughs> yeah, it's such a myth. <laughs> yeah. So what I saw was the deeper, right? The yeah. deeper, you know, lifestyle that they went into. And so that was my biggest fear. Yeah. And and I didn't know, again, too, I didn't know that there was like a little bit of tiny little bit of hope inside of me, right? For this, a life yeah. without drugs and alcohol, a normal kind of life. And I think that's what kind of always kept me convicted of doing things and not doing things. Yeah. You know, even though I was strung out and way out there mentally and stuff there was mm -hmm. always this kind of little bit of you know maybe a guardian guardian angel or something right <laughs> something right. that kind of held me back from that going over that right that threshold that for me prison would have been that threshold so that was <clears throat> i was in redwood city county jail and you know i was facing this case with three years prison and uh, my moment of clarity brought me to my knees you mm. know it brought me to my knees and so um you know my my grandma and grandpa were missionaries <clears throat> okay. a Navajo Indian reservation in New Mexico. And that was kind of, they, my grandma would always talk to me about God, you know, cool. but I had never had this relationship, you know, right. really. So, um, I had burnt all my bridges, right. In jail, you know, who was I going to call? Who was going to help me? You right. know, I had no money for a lawyer, you know, I didn't have nothing. So I thought, you know, in that moment, my grandma's kind of words kind of, I heard in my, in my mind, like, God loves you. Like I pray for you all the time. God loves you. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, and that was kind of, you know, and so I was writing a letter to my sister, basically kind of sharing all this with her, like, hey, you know, this is probably it for me if I go down this path. And I don't know why I'm here. I don't know. You know, the whole, again, it was just all blur, I guess, from the moment I started drinking and using, right? You sure. know how that works. You're just of like, course. what happened? <laughs> Dude, yeah. All these years are gone and all yeah. this wreckage and all this yeah. stuff, and it's just a blur. And then here you are getting ready to go to prison. Yeah. I like, totally, you, you and I have a very similar story. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't realize how similar it is, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you're like, what I do? Yeah. For the last 10 years I did what? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. And it's sh shameful, I think. And, you know, those moments where you're just like, wow, I'm throwing my life away. So how did, so, <clears throat> so, um, so what ended up happening? Obviously, you didn't go to prison for three years, and you got mm -hmm. obviously you had a moment where you had a moment of clarity with Jesus. Mm -hmm. So what got you from the jail cell to being a free man, being clean and sober, and now mm -hmm. going that that road? What where did that? How did that all happen? Yeah, so I um, kind of had this. I was in jail. I kind of had this vision of like getting on my knees and crying out to God. You sure. Know? I don't know why this thing just kind of went through my mind. Yeah. So I did that. I got in the jail cell there and I began, I cried this prayer to God. God cares my life. I don't know how this works. You know, right. take me, I'm yours. And I began to weep, you know, uncontrollably. And I know now that the Holy Spirit was with me, yes. right? Because the healing came to me on that day in my heart and my mind, right? Yeah. There was, there was a freedom that happened. Like right. we hear about so many times people who tell their story, right? Mm -hmm. How they give their life to God and, and, you know, ultimately it's Jesus, but I didn't know that yet, right? <clears throat> 
um, and they feel this freedom, yeah. all surpassing, right? Freedom and joy and, and peace. And so I got up on that day and my new life had begun, mm. right? My new journey had begun, <laughs> mm. right? There was still a lot more to do, right? Of course, right. right but right. my new journey had begun and, and I, that little hope that was in there, that glimmer of hope that, of life that was still left in me, you know, began to shine. You know, I just, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to get well, you know, I wanted to start a new life and I had no idea what that looked like. But so for me, the first miracle was the judge, the courts allowed me to get out of jail, no prison. If I went to a program, a treatment program, and I successfully completed it, they would leave, they would give me probation time for that, the remainder of prison time that I would have served. So, you know, I said this prayer, I go to court and then I'm out on the street like a couple days later and I'm like, it's a miracle. Right. I'm preparing myself, you know, to right. go to prison. Right. That's right. what my public defender told me. Like, you, you know, you violate probation and, you know, more than likely you're looking at three years prison time. Right, right. So from that, that was, I, you know, I call my, my story, I feel like it's the breadcrumb, the breadcrumb story of praying and following these breadcrumbs as God lays them out for me sure. in my life, sure. you know. Yeah, so awesome. yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, the miracle for me is I got out, I was free and I had another chance. <clears throat> so I continued to pray, okay, God, now what, <laughs> you know, yeah. where do I go now? What, what's next? So, you know, I had, you know, contacted my mom. She took me back in for a short period of time until I could get into this, this program. And so I called and waiting for a bed and they didn't have any beds and I prayed, God, <laughs> I need help. I need to get into this place because, right. yeah. you know, I'm not going to make it. <clears throat> out on the you know sure back out on the street with all this environments and all this right right this stuff it's gonna be really hard for me to to make it out here and so you know even though i had that hope to want to live right mm -hmm. i was surrounded by you know the temptations oh yeah it's to drink and use yeah, and everything course, yeah, yeah right away because all the people i knew were doing that kind of yeah. stuff yeah so. well, you and i both know how crucial that is mm -hmm. that window of opportunity to get into a bed and get into a recovery program yeah and going back on the streets is very crucial. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, especially when you have that desire and you want to change. Yeah, but the so. influence is still very strong and you're very yeah. new. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have the strength. I didn't have the courage or the, yeah. or the understanding or the tools Yeah. To, to call somebody or go to a meeting, right, and all this stuff to work through that, navigate through temptation and all that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I got into the program and I completed it and, you know, I was successful to the judge and the, and the courts and I yeah. was on probation and I got a sponsor and, you know, I was going to these meetings, the 12-step meetings, you yeah. know, and I began to, you know, hear about these promises that we that are promised to us if we do these, these this program and you know live in this way and and you know the twelve steps is really about connecting with God or reconnecting with God and then mm -hmm. learning to live a life, you know, with God, mm -hmm. being led by God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's that's absolute. So you so you complete the program, right? <clears throat> You're on probation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you completed probation. Yep. Right. Never turned back. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Kept moving forward. Yeah. And then um, uh, higher power. How did I know you're I know you're a leader at higher power now, but yeah. how did you how did that happen? I was bust in by one of these programs. OK, yeah. for, for those who are watching this podcast or or on YouTube or listening to it, higher power is a Christian 12 step meeting that meets every Friday night mm -hmm. at Central Peninsula in Foster City. It's been meeting for 27 years. Coming up on 30. Coming up on yeah. 30. Yeah, in June. Goodness we'll have... gracious. Coming up on 30 years. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm, good thing we're not aging, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up on 30 years, and it's an amazing place. It's it's where the 12 steps meet the cross. Yeah. And then we know that Jesus is at the cross, the foot of the cross, and he takes up the rest of our burdens. Yeah. And so anyway, which is was instrumental in my recovery. Yeah. Which I know is instrumental in my recovery. Met. Is where we met. So <laughs> retreat. Yeah. And thank God, <laughs> right? Because you walked me through a lot of other stuff outside of my drug addiction. But anyway, sure. for those who are listening, because there's a lot of mm -hmm. people who listen to the podcast and the YouTube that are just church based. Okay. And people that listen to it are also trying to find out they want to learn more about us folks yeah. and that are seeking recovery and um or and claim to be recovered. Okay. Because of our relationship, so they don't know what higher power is. We know what higher yeah. power is, but they don't know the organization higher power. So anyway, right. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, and then you know I had all the things stacked against me, right? No license, all these fines, all the stuff that we have, right? And so um, I continued to pray. You know, I think when I was in the program, they gave us these little daily bread, 
books yes. that you get in institutions. And mm-hmm. that was my first kind of introduction to reading some scripture and praying and seeing how God would work, you know, in my life. And so um, he connected me with the sponsor, a great sponsor who, you know, I learned in the program to, you know, ask. If you don't know, ask. If you're not sure, ask. And this whole willingness, right? What are you willing to do? I know how willing I was to go and get anything I wanted, drugs or alcohol. For sure. I would do anything. Yeah. You know, I would. Yeah. There was, there was, you know, um, and so I tried to try to apply that willingness to my recovery. Yeah. And so I called my sponsor about everything. I mean, I did, <laughs> this is what I had to do. My thinking was messed up. Yep. Even though I had started this new life, right, in Christ and this new hope and this new, you know, desire, right, to want to get, you know, better, I had no idea how to do it. Yeah. So my sponsor, you know, walked me through a lot. He gave me a job and, you know, we talked recovery every day and we were going to meetings together and, you know, I just really, you know, dove into it. And they say the only thing you have to change is everything, <laughs> right? You know, it was just, just a little bit, just a little bit. I mean, again, it's, it's, you know, so uh, those kind of words, those mottos and stuff, I kind of held on to those things, you know, because those are the things that, how, how are people doing it? You would hear like in the program, oh, I want what that guy has. And I would hear about these men who had businesses and, you know, who had these lives, their, their wives and their kids and, you know, and how they were doing this stuff. They were managing all these things, mm-hmm. you know, being recovered, being recovered. And, and it wasn't just like, you no, know, now they were recovered and they didn't need, you know, that became my family, right? I had to I have, I had a new family, yeah. people in, you know, the 12 step rooms. These are the people that I was going to walk through life with. Yeah. Through my tears and through my ups and through my downs. Yeah. You know, and I came to rely on, that was my network that I built around me was either, you know, once I got more into, you know, the church life or the past, you know, spiritual life. Right now I have mentors who are pastors. I have, you know, sponsor, you know, and this kind of stuff. So this became my network of people who I could call on for things. Yeah. And that helped me through a lot. Yeah. So okay. from, from hanging out with unhealthy. Yeah. Right. To <laughs> yes. hanging out, hanging out with positive and healthy. Yeah. Well, and yeah. yeah, and you're right. Making choices around who you want to be around and not, you know, because yeah. in the program you have all these people don't want to be there. People want to, you know, go and make things, you know, lie and drink and, you know, they want to do all this stuff. So I had to learn early on too. They call it, you know, hang with the winners, stick with the winners was one of the, yeah. you know, the mottos things early on. I'm like, what does that mean? You know what I mean? It was just people who were willing to, you know, get honest, you know, remain willing and, yeah. and do the work. Yeah. And so, yeah. And like I said, and like you were saying, like before I knew it, I had these, you know, this year, year would be... <laughs> Two years, <laughs> you're just yeah. like, whoa, what is happening, right? And right, right. and I saw a lot of people falling off, falling off, falling off, right, and relapsing and going backwards. And and so I learned. I try to learn from those people. So I'm I'm grateful that I think God gives me a clear enough mind. When someone comes back in and says, you know, I relapsed and it didn't work, it, what would makes it, you know, what makes me think is going to work for me? <laughs> right. What's different? You know, what's right. you know, similarities, not the differences. Right. Is another thing we hear about, and I try to hold on to that a lot. Sure. Because I'm the same as any other addict and alcoholic. I can't, you know, I can't go back out there and just have one or two beers, you know, and think that everything's going to be normal again, ever. You, you know, for me, I think one of the biggest um, wake up calls for me was when I started going to higher power. Mm-hmm. I had about 18 months sober when uh, Teresa first brought me into higher power. Yeah. And uh, getting to know people that had. 15, 20 years sobriety yeah, and going out after having 20 years sober mm-hmm. and dying within 24 hours of going out, yeah. having a, a just massive heart attack from relapsing because they, they went back to the, they shot the load that they were shooting 20 years prior. Right. And their body can't handle it. Yeah. And I thought to myself, man, this, this disease is fierce. Yeah. And um, it's so fierce <clears throat> that if you're not hanging out with the winners, and you're not being accountable. Yeah. Man, it just wants to kill you. Yeah. And I saw that. I saw that just like you, people yeah. going out. And I saw it the way it was just destroying marriages and stuff. And I thought, man, I, I yeah. don't want that. Mm-hmm. You know, it scared me. Yeah. It scared me enough to keep me on the right, right path. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. I'm like, no. Nope, yeah. And, and it's sad. I mean, I hate to see it destroy people's lives. But it, it like you, it was like you just said, for me, it was mm-hmm. that was a wake up call for me to realize how mm-hmm. deadly this disease is. Yeah. Cause I'm no different. Yeah. If, if I was to go out today, I would go right to where I left off mm-hmm. and you know, 16 years, you got 18 years, yeah. right? It, mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're, um, you're going to go, your body's not going to be able to handle it. Definitely not. Yeah. You it, think mentally you think yeah, you can, you but think you can. You're physically your body's going to be like, what the heck are you putting in me? Yeah. I think even if I tried to like smoke a cigarette today or something, I'd be I like, you're right. Like, oh, oh. it would just be, yeah. you know, and yeah, you're right. I think you're absolutely right. We build up that immunity. We build up that tolerance 
For you and I, the, the, I think the difference is I don't know if the drugs would kill me before Sean killed me, like <laughs> like Tina. Yeah, you. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't yeah, know right. which would be which would be more fierce to face, the yeah. Riyadh's or my wife. But definitely hey. our wives. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, yeah. I definitely wouldn't want to come walking through the front door. Yeah, that'd be bad. Definitely not. Gosh, <laughs> that'd be bad. Yeah, those are the kind of things that are we set set place in our lives to help us protect us, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not afraid of you know. <laughs> get loaded again i'm afraid of my what i got a face yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and just the, you know just the devastation you know yeah. the, the the look on our, our well you've got kids now yeah just the look on their face oh yeah they would be just oh i just yeah anyway i, I just couldn't i couldn't even imagine what that would look like to isaiah yeah right i wouldn't want to do that yeah you know yep you know um i i stay sober for myself but at mm -hmm. the same time yeah. that that idea of what it would look like to my kid if yeah. i failed that mm -hmm. oh I just couldn't do that to somebody else. Yeah, God's given us responsibility yeah. and, and people to, which are <clears throat> things we set up, right? To help oh, us yeah. in our recovery. And playing the tape, I heard Leon like play that tape, right? That yep. all the way through. All the way through. You know. Yeah, not halfway. Yeah, not halfway through. <laughs> all the way through. And you and I know how it ends. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it's, bad. it's a Yeah, it's a horrible ending. So let's see. Um, yeah. So you just kind of go through a little history yeah, yeah. here. So when I met you, mm -hmm. you were working as a mechanic. Yep. And fixing Mercedes and doing that, and but I always, I always heard from you. There was always this underline: I'm going to be in ministry. I want to get into ministry. I want to get into ministry. And 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 uh, uh, but you know, this is just a day job, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then a couple of years later, you started getting into ministry, and the the founder and the leader of of Higher Power passed away. Yeah, Steve Harrell, mm -hmm. and. Um, and then shortly after, they I guess they approached you and asked you if you wanted to take on leadership and CPC mm -hmm. kind of poured into you. Yeah. Um, and gave you the ability to go to school mm -hmm. to, to get your degree and start becoming a pastor. And mm -hmm. um, and so here you are. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, you're leading higher power now and you're married and mm -hmm. one kid, three years old, and mm -hmm. one that's really close. Anytime. Anytime. <clears throat> yes. So how's that feel? It's, it's like, yeah, it's amazing. It really is. It's amazing. I think that whole journey, of course, I have a, I have stories for all, all the different parts of those journeys, but learning to listen to God, right. And trust God when he calls us yeah. to do things sometimes come with big risks. Sure. And the stirring for me forever, like I was telling you, I want to get in ministry, you know, was that nudge and that continued to stir, but eventually I had to make the hard choices to transition right out that of that leap of faith yeah leap of right. faith you know because yeah, because the, the the mechanic stuff is pretty lucrative yeah i mean it's kind of hard to walk away from a it, bunch right? of tools that i had invested in and and, and you know and i had a small and... business i ended up having a small business yeah. as part of the transition thing right i yeah. ended up having a small business for a year that god you know it didn't work out you know yeah. and god you know it was just now i see like i said there's a whole story around that what happened within that and there was a reason why for that year i was yeah. there and a right. bunch of stuff happened with my family and I was able to hold my job and, you know, and have someone at the shop when I was gone, you know, so there's a lot of things I think that happened during that time. Why, why the, during that season. And so, but eventually, right. It all led to, you know, a lot of clear, you know, um, direction from God yeah. about getting into ministry and that whole path. And, you know, so, but it's exciting. Um, I, I love doing this because watching God work in people's lives, right. And, and that transforming power, right that we all we experience you know and that we can experience on a daily basis some people get to experience for the first time right or again you know people come back to to god when they drift away and they come back to god and so i realize you know that there's a lot of things we, we could be doing with our lives right there's a lot of important things you know that we can be doing in our lives but it's sobering to know that my family is obviously the most important right gift sure. the treasured gift amen because my boys right are going to be influencers yeah. they're going to be yeah. you know doing things in the world and they're going to have a choice of what they do and right. so influencing them is the most important thing and on top of that right god allows us to be part of you know the work that he's doing in in churches and in recovery and in homeless ministry and stuff like that so it's it's a lot of work you know mm -hmm. and it's a lot of sacrifice and discipline but it always it always outweighs it's good right, to have a good wife at home huh? yes definitely yeah. <laughs> i mean you, you i will say you, you tina mm -hmm. and sean yeah um, I don't want to, I, you know, when I say have a good wife at home. I don't mean like, you know, my, you know, not to, I'm not so chauvinistic, but, yeah. my, but, but knowing that I have my wife behind me, like yeah. you have Tina behind you. Yeah. Cause ministry is demanding. Definitely. 
And, um, and it's good to know that you have a, a wife that is willing to go roll with the punches yeah. and support through ministry. Cause it's, it is, it's demanding. It's, it's, yeah, it's a lot. And it's, it's good having a solid woman of Christ at home. Absolutely. Well, you and I both know we, we kind of, we finally submitted the, that area of our life, right? To God. Yeah. Oh yeah. And when we look at, yeah. Wow. I mean, look what God had in store for us. Yeah. That we had no clue. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I had, a lot of, I had a lot of junk holding me back. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And we had to continue to submit, right? Mm -hmm. All that area of our life and everything we, our expectations and everything we thought, right? And all our fears and all that stuff around yeah. marriage and around family and, and all yeah. that stuff. And so God is faithful through that. And yeah. even more, he's blessed us yeah. beyond measure. <laughs> yeah. What's it, so you've been, how long have you and Tina been married now? Uh, nine years. Nine years. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's been a good journey, huh? It has been a very good journey. Yeah. And you got a three-year-old? I got a three, yeah, three and a half. Yeah. And yeah. so, and he's, yeah, the greatest thing ever. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> he's just amazing. Um, so want to <clears throat> kind of maybe share a little bit too is, is, um, so now going into a new chapter in your life, um, obviously you get your Street Life Ministries shirt on. Yeah. Right? You're yeah. working for Street Life Ministries now. Right. And, uh. I know you're still working part time with CPC, but mm -hmm. you're working part time with Street Life, and um, and I, I, you know, it's interesting. I was just kind of thinking here, you know, talk about being going from being a mechanic to being a, a ministry leader. Yeah, you're still kind of a mechanic, you know, in a ways, That's right? right? Because yeah. God, now you're just a spiritual mechanic, you know, right. and you're working with broken folks, yeah, spiritually, and they and they come to you, and then you try to figure out because everybody's so different, right? From from yeah. the cars you worked on, every transmission was a different yeah, thing, right? Well, every right. broken heart and every addict is is a different yeah. situation. So it's like, mm -hmm. now you tap into a different source, right? You're yeah. tapping into G the Lord. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so- um, I like that analogy. Does that work? That's good, yeah. It's like <laughs> I mean, Jesus is a- Different tools, you have different tools to- you're well, right. Jesus is a carpenter, <laughs> yeah. right? And he, and he never stopped being a carpenter, right? Yeah. Even in his 33 years of ministry, he was still building and work, building his kingdom. Yeah. I feel like that's what we we're, we strive to be more like Christ, right? So, yeah. um, my wife teases I went from dope connections to hope connections. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah that's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. You know, a lot of ways we're just applying our passions and our gifts and stuff to good stuff now. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I remember uh, early on being labeled ADD okay. and dyslexic, and you know, mm -hmm. when I was young, I mean, the, the schools labeled me as a special special ed and all this stuff. Okay, and then that's what spun me into not like you not feeling loved or wanted, yeah. that's what spun me into my addiction. Nobody, I felt like I wasn't loved at home. I felt like I wasn't loved in, in, anywhere. So I just yeah. spun into out of control. So I hung out with all the, the wrong choice of people. Sure. And I drove out to that. Never would have thought at the age of 35, coming to Jesus and getting sober that God would use my ADD and dyslexia yeah. to, to serve the kingdom. And now it's like, yeah. I'm, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Who would have ever thought? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, yeah, so t talk about what we're what, what's what's new in your life and what we're doing now. Like, you know, just so people kind of have an idea. We haven't really made an official announcement, but I yeah. guess this will be kind of a yeah a, an open open for that. Yeah, well, like you said, I think it's it's so it's such a blessing that God has put me in a, a unique place where I can be, you know, both involved in in higher power and and street life and seeing like we've talked over the years the connections, the mm -hmm. possibilities of connections, and the you know, and and it's all God's work. Right, mm -hmm. but having the flexibility and the freedom to grow and to nurture, you know, and to to um, be used, you know, however God wants to use me within these different um, these different opportunities, different ministries, has been very very special. And so, you know, this this stirring for like a program has been on. It was in Steve Orell's heart. It was on his mind for a long time. I mean, I think a, you know, a lot of us have in the recovery community leaders have talked about the need, the great need here, right on the peninsula for something like this. And so, I'm really excited to see God you know, bring it forth, mm -hmm. you know, the stirring and just the ideas and the visions that come, you know, and you're just like, whoa, this would be great. We could do this. And and then now having the freedom and flexibility to build it. Yeah. Right. Together and to really listen to God and really trust his guiding and his direction, you know, through this thing kind yeah. of from scratch. That's yeah. super exciting because, yeah. you know, through our conversations, we just see God kind of giving us, you know, insight and direction on um, how he would build this, this program. So, I'm excited to be part of it. I think the obviously the need here on the peninsula outweighs the resources that are here by far. Oh yeah. The need, you know, that <clears throat> people have. So I'm excited to see how God's gonna move through this. And yeah. to see how he's gonna use us <clears throat> use us and our gifts and the team's gifts yeah. individually and uniquely to 
to grow this thing and just you know watch lives be changed. Oh, it's gonna be amazing. It doesn't. It just feels kind of like everything I've done is built up to this point, right? Same Doesn't here. it? Yeah. Same here. It feels like yeah. everything we've done is built up to this point where now we're like, you know, can be more focused on life transformation yeah. in, a, in, a, in an environment that allows that. So go, I so. just, um, you know, for, for, for me, it's been like, I love street life ministries. I love the nighttime, the feeding, the, the everything that we've done, yeah. you know, for the last 21 years. Um, 13 years for me, but the 21 years it's been around. I, I love yeah. everything it represents. But, you know, Sean and I, for the last several years, have been praying, like, what is the next? Yeah. What is next for Street Life Ministries? And we just, right at the beginning of COVID, it mm -hmm. just hit Sean and I like a faith based recovery program needs wow. to be here in the peninsula. Yeah. And, um, you know, we just thought, you know what, let's do it. Let's 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 just cast this vision out and see what other people think. And yeah. I've casted it out, and and you and Mike and a yeah. bunch of other people, my board and stuff. They're like, absolutely, that's great. <laughs> and so I've just been like, okay, yeah. this is this is it, you know. Yeah. And hopefully, this men's recovery program takes off so successfully that we can then launch a, a women's recovery program here on yeah. the peninsula, mm -hmm. all faith based. You know, everything's yeah. about about the Lord, and mm -hmm. you know, and just really seeing lives get changed i just I, I can't wait to see what god is going to do yeah through you and mike and, and whoever else that we get brought into this ministry and yeah me too it's gonna be powerful yeah i'm, I'm really super excited i don't even know what to i can't put my finger on <laughs> what's going to happen next but yeah. i know that the conversations that we've had every time i've gotten off the phone with you and mike i'm just like yes yeah me too yeah it's so it's, it's gonna be awesome <laughs> it is gonna you know, be great i can't yeah. wait to see some of our most hardcore homeless mm -hmm. that we've been dealing with for years go through the program yeah. and walk out of the front door with their yeah. hands held up high yep and their fate and their head held up high knowing that <clears throat> that's yeah. it i'm done i don't I'm need to go back i'm recovered I'm, yeah and i'm like that's going to be just like for me yeah that's all I, I could just sit back all day long and and just cheer that on yeah you know yeah so and and seeing how they're going to make an impact right and the productive member of society and how they go out and do things like we've got to do right yeah and, and sit down in front of the do a podcast or yeah. sit down and, and just hear what they have to say about what and god's doing story. in their life yeah. and tell their story and just go wow because you, you know the one thing i've learned about higher power that i've loved so much about it and that why i think faith-based recovery is so important <clears throat> is that look at over the last 30 years yeah that the hundreds and thousands of people that have come through higher power mm -hmm. that have never gone back out and used right and they've changed a whole course yeah. Of a generation within their family. Yeah. That'll never use because, mm -hmm. yeah. because of their decision to accept right. Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Yeah. And to work a 12 step program mm -hmm. and never go back to drugs and alcohol. Yeah. They've changed marriages. They've changed the course of their children, yeah. their children's children. Yeah. All because, because God entered into their life. Yeah. And they decided, they said, hey. Yeah. Right? They, yeah. The first three steps, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Right? Chains are you broken. Know? Yeah, and, and chains were broken, and and I think that we'll do the same thing with this recovery. Oh, I think so too. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited, bro. I get, I'm too. all pumped up right now. <laughs> Me I too. Go all day long <laughs> on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like you said, it's excited to see how God's putting those pieces together, the right yeah. people, you know, yeah, <clears throat> the right people to get this thing going and and do it. So yeah. So um, as we get as we wrap this up, yeah. Anything that you'd like? So, like I said, the, a lot of people that listen to this podcast or they watch the YouTube mm -hmm. um, are, I get, it's a mix between people who are in recovery, mm -hmm. people who are just churchgoers, and then people who are st still trying to figure out like, what's the deal with addicts and homelessness and stuff. So there's a lot of people that are just kind of like, you know, um, yeah. normies. Sure. Um, is there anything that you would say to anybody that's watching this? Um I don't know. Just is there any last final thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, another big vision for us, right, is to have more recovery ministries at churches, mm -hmm. you know. And so it doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, you can have six or seven people come in to a meeting every week and they, that may be their only way. That might be their only segue into, you know, I mean, ironically, higher power has been for 30 years. A lot of people don't even know it's there. <laughs> they have never yeah. heard about it, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of how these recovery ministries are. They're kind of more, you know, even though we have social media and different things like that, it's just there's a lot of hurting and hopeless people out there that would come to the church or maybe in your congregation 
that need help and they just have no clue. So creating, you know, recovery ministries at churches, um, we love to partner and help people get those things going. And those can also be, you know, feeders for us to into to our program and things like that. So I would just say, you know, if you've been feeling that calling to have recovery ministry at your church in some capacity, you know, you're more than welcome to contact me or Dave and, and we can talk more about that. And so having more of these these meetings available in different areas is is vital to keeping that door open. We like to say that, um, uh, let's see, th- th- this is the side door to the church for people who would never come through the front door. Right? I like that. In the community. So they're willing to maybe come to your church for a recovery ministry and they're not really even understanding that it's at a church or, you know, sure. but they would never come through your front door on Sunday. Mm-hmm. But one day they might. That's what happened with us, right? That's right. <laughs> I came through yes. the side door. Totally. <laughs> and yes. now I go through the front door yeah. and I know elders by name and pastors by name. And, you know, and so yeah. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of work that can be done in small groups. Sure. In the church and a recovery ministry thing it doesn't have to be a big glamorous, you know, thing. So, you know, yeah. That'd be cool to see. And I never I never really thought about it, but it'd be really cool to see multiple higher powers start up at different churches. Yeah. You know, and it, like you said, it doesn't take but, you know, six or seven people to really yeah. form a group. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's like, well, the doors are open for us if there's one addict there or there's a hundred addicts there. I mean, and, and you know, so it's that's our motto and that's that's the way we, we run it because every time we've focused on, you know, obviously bigger numbers, God has always shown us. Right. You know, the one or two person, the person that comes and says, oh, I wasn't going to come tonight because, you know, I heard there can be a lot of people here sometimes and, and it's, I'm, gl- I'm glad that it's small tonight. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> this is my first time in a meeting. You know, we've heard that before. I've never been to a meeting before. This is my first time here. Yeah. And so God and so, we go, OK, God, you know, that's what we're here for. Yeah. We're always here for the one. Oh, you absolutely. Know, we're always here for the one. Well, yeah, like, you know Jesus, like Jesus said, you know, he leaves the 99 and yeah. he goes after that yeah. lost one. Yeah. And there's a lot of lost ones. Yeah. Right? I mean, the church is the, the the is the hospital for the sick. Exactly. I think people forget that. that yeah. We're not all fancy and dusted off. I mean, we're, we're, we're a messed up bunch. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and I want people to also know that as they listen to this too, is that, you know, don't put drugs and alcohol around addiction because there's a lot of various yeah. areas of addiction i mean as mm-hmm. you and i both that's how you and yeah. i got bonded is i was clean right. and sober off drugs and alcohol <clears throat> and then i found myself stuck in a, an addiction of of a sexual addiction and i didn't right. even mm-hmm. was even realizing it yeah right and 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 i knew that you knew something about a class that gets yeah. people like on the right path for mm-hmm. uh, integrity right and um Thank God that you were there. Yeah. Because you because of you and because of Sebastian and because of that 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 recovery yeah. ministry, I got saved. I yeah. and I know for a fact I would have God would have never put Sean in my life. Right. If I hadn't gone to that class. Yeah. yeah. God would have never honored me with the marriage I have today. <clears throat> right. If it wasn't for you and Sebastian yeah. bringing me into a small little group of what yeah. there was like five or six of us. Yep. Right. Yeah. I'll never. I'll never forget the night I walked in there. I was just everybody. I thought everybody's. Oh, these guys are all perverts. <laughs> and I got. They got all messed up until yeah. it got to me, and I realized, <laughs> man, I am messed up. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You're right. We trade one addiction for another, and I think that's those are the subtle ways, you know, that you know we can get lost within the recovery ministry. Yeah. So the recovery ministry, especially within our church, and, and Christ-centered recovery is for all types of addictions. Over the years, we've had different people come with different different things and so yeah. you know we can point them all to the the same source <clears throat> right so yeah i mean you can have any kind of recovery ministry at your church for you know and we have a lot of information and a lot of templates and stuff that people can use you know our, our goal and our idea right is to make these things run you know seamless for people just right. open your church open your doors you know and allow to have a safe place for people to meet what do you mean? Keep it simple, stupid? Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> and let God do the rest. <laughs> let God do the rest. You know, because, you know. <laughs> she heard that somewhere before. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. You know, just open your doors. And, yeah. and these people are great people. And they're such a blessing to congregations. I know oh. oftentimes, right, it's, you know, the tattoos and maybe the smoking and the, you know, they look different. They sound different. They feel them. But they're such a blessing. Sure. Higher power. And everybody agrees at CPC that higher power has been just an immense blessing to that church. Sure. The recovery and the people that a lot have. of truth coming out of that room. Ooh, yeah. A lot of honesty. Oh, they love it. They <laughs> love it. And that's why we get so much support from them to because yeah. they've seen the they've seen the fruit and they've seen the work that God does through recovery ministry. Cool. Yep. Thanks, Ricky. You're welcome. You wanna pray us out? Sure. Let's awesome. Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for 
for your grace and your mercy, God, and your, your forgiveness, Lord. And we thank you, God, that your mercies are new each day, Lord. And, and that tells us that we need uh, daily reprieve, God. We need daily reprieve, God, from this life and from um, the challenges in this life. So we thank you, Lord, for your mercies that are new every day, God. And I thank you for Dave and for Sean, and I thank you for Street Life Ministries, God. And I just, I'm, I'm just in awe of the work that you've done in this ministry and the continued work that you will do through Street Life in the peninsula yes, God. for the lost, the hurting, and the broken, God. So we just pray and ask that your hand would continue to be over this ministry and protect everyone, um, anybody who's on staff and Anybody who serves at Street Life, God, that you would protect them, watch over them, and keep them close to you, God. Yes, God. We thank you for this program, Lord. Would you bless it, and would you continue to lead and guide us, God, into the ways that you would have this yes, program Lord. unfold. And thank you for the generosity of people already who have been giving to this program. We know that it's your hand, God, and it's your you're guiding us, Lord. So yes, we just pray and continue to ask to keep our ears attentive, God, and our minds focused on you as we continue to listen and, yes, and watch and be guided, God, by you for this program. And may it be for your purpose in your glory, God, and not ours. Mm. And may these podcasts bless people who hear yes, them. Lord. May they be encouraged, God, and may they be inspired in a world that often says that the outcast has no place to go, God, that you have open doors and you have open hearts of people um, to, to welcome these folks. Uh, homeless are addicted or just ones who have drifted away from you, God, back to your loving arms. And so we just thank you, Lord, and pray for every person who's listening to this. Bless them, watch over them and their households, and keep them safe in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, Ricky, thank yep. you. You're welcome. Cool.